What's happening girls and bruces? This is Cousin Bogria aka Bruce and today we're going to look at some cryptic and interesting details in Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior. While everyone's fucking raving about that new Fury Road movie, my cousin Rob Egg has been putting together a really detailed film analysis of Road Warrior and I've been privy to some of the stuff he's come up with, so here goes. First up, the filmmakers actually put together written personal histories for all of the characters which the actors and art department then used to flesh out those characters through their costumes, vehicles, and the subtleties of their acting. Take the humongous for example. This guy's remembered for his muscles, mask, and codpiece, but there's a lot more to him. His hair and ears have been burned off, leaving us to wonder if he wears that mask just for tough guy show, or to hide some horrific facial injuries. During the torture scene, he recites an old poem from some German 18th century philosopher, and in his gun case he has a variety of military service medals, a really old picture of some couple from one of the big wars, and he's got a bloody German Tottenkopf skull and bones insignia, and his spokesman describes him as the Ayatollah. The Ayatollah of Rock and Roller! An Ayatollah, for those of you who don't know, is a high-ranking Islamic cleric. So either the humongous represents some sort of warlord archetype that has existed in many wars across the centuries, or he has quite a personal interest in human history. Then we've got really odd behaviour from some of the other bad guy characters. Take this crazy ass Wes dude. He's fucking nuts mate, but not just in the obvious ways. You remember the rape scene where he pins a guy to a wheel with his crossbow? Well watch what he does first. He stares at his golden youth lover first and then shoots the other guy. What's that all about? Do he and the golden boy have some sick Sado thing going on between them? Or is the lover boy a slave of his who is being given a warning of what will happen to him if he ever tries to run? And here's another clue. If you take a look at the golden youth's tattoos in the HD version of the film, he has a tattoo of a woman's face with the name Linda below it. Enough said. So what else have we got going on that's easy to miss? Well, the Jara Captain is an interesting character too. He comes off as a buffoon in the way he dresses, and with that Stonehenge gob full of teeth, but he's actually a really fucking cool guy. Max looks the part, but he's dead inside, while Jaro wears a flower over his heart and a pink scarf and shoes, so he's right in touch with his feminine side. Regardless of whatever shit he's been through in the past, he keeps his sense of humour, and he's quick to seize opportunities that Max ignores. This machine of yours, I can take two, can Possibly. Listen, I was wrong about you. I'm sorry. He could even be seen as the real hero of the film because it's him who takes over leadership of Papagello's clan. As for Max himself, yeah, he's cool as fuck, but there's really subtle things going on for him too. Director George Miller stated in a 1984 interview that Max's dog shares his emotions, like the two are kindred. So basically Max is now the equivalent of a stray dog. So we get assorted little parallels between the two of them. The dog has a red sash around its neck and Max keeps a red oil rag tied around his arm. Max has an injured leg and a brace, and although it's not stated in the film, the script states that the dog would have a missing limb. And then there's the big obvious one of Max, Eating dog food. Check out this marketing poster too. Max and the humongous are each standing halfway into frame, like a mirror image of each other. In the movie, the humongous is a lot beefier than Max, but in the poster, they have the same bloody physique. So, a bit more about Max. Papagallo calls him a scavenger midway through the movie. You're a scavenger, Max. You're a maggot. You know that? But there was a subtle hint of this in an earlier scene too. When Max tries to scavenge the gyrocopter for fuel, the scene introduces Max's approaching car with an overlaid sound of a scavenging bird. The timing is really specific, so it's unlikely to be incidental. And if you're not convinced, have a listen again as Max gets out of his car. It happens again. You're living off the corpse of the old world. Later, when Max returns to the scene, he scavenges a dead body, and the first thing he finds is a dice. He considers it for a moment and tosses it away. Now, for those of you who don't get it, I'll spell out the obvious. The dice is a symbol of chance, 
of luck. And chances are a thing Max isn't willing to take, especially when it comes to reconnecting with other human beings. Go on, get out. Let's get. Yeah. Slight change of topic now. Remember that gorgeous opening montage? Did you ever wonder about why footage from the World Wars was used to represent a war in the future? Well, it can just be taken as artistic license and a way of saving on a budget. But like I pointed out earlier, the humongous has World War 1 and 2 stuff in his gun case. But there's other historical references that are more specific. At the time the film was made, there was a conglomerate of oil companies that were seen as the dominant force in the Middle East oil production, and they were often referred to as the Seven Sisters. So what do we find on the oil tanker in Mad Max 2? We only find a fucking Seven Sisters petroleum logo that's been made up for the movie, but seems to be modelled on the logo of Gulf Oil, itself one of the Seven Sisters conglomerate. And while we're on the subject of oil, did you ever notice that when Max is mopping up the oil from a recently crashed car with his red rag, the driver's blood is pouring out of the car too and is mixing with the oil? Very cryptic. Next up, let's look at the feral kid. There's lots to say about him, but I don't want to give away too much of the game, so I'll just tell you one little detail, which is that the script describes him as having yellow eyes. But they probably dropped it when making the film, because it would involve making the child actor wear contact lenses. And of course, human beings never have yellow eyes. Get it? Moving on, something that works really well in Mad Max 2's favour, is that the non-speaking extras and bad guys are given a bit more life by the fact that most of them appear in more than one scene. We see the whole lot of the marauders at once when the humongous makes his false offer of a peaceful resolution, and several of these characters are recognisable in later battle scenes. For example, the fellow whose lovemaking with his girlfriend is interrupted later gets crushed under the tanker. <laughs> So even though he never speaks, we know that his death will leave a very heartbroken woman behind. This depiction of non-speaking extras having a life outside the scene in which they are killed is very different to most action films, in which wafer-thin enemy characters are introduced for no reason other than to be quickly killed like animated practice targets. Their deaths leave no sense of tragedy, no sense that their removal from the world has caused any difference to anybody. Regarding the film's sense of humour, there's a nice little semi ad lib scene here which includes a joke about this fella's teeth. Got a crack timing case colour, it's broken a couple of teeth off the timing gear. Yeah, the radio's damaged the core. You've got 12! Okay. okay. It's a great little comedy moment, but perhaps it's more than just a joke. The script includes a similar metaphor. This handful of garbage that Max tosses aside from the dead guy's pockets is actually a necklace made out of teeth and spark plugs. And last but not least, furthering the movie's theme of the bad guys representing the darker side of humanity, lots of them are ex-cops, just like Max. Even his would-be assassin in this scene is a cop. Wouldn't it have been great if this guy pulled his mask down and turned out to be the spitting image of Max himself? Well, that's all you're getting for now, folks. Like I say, my cousin Rob Ager's doing a proper analysis of the movie because there's shitloads more to be said about it. So, make sure to subscribe and check out all his other vids on here, and check out his website, collativelearning.com. And if you're willing to dip into your pockets, you can always go and order some of his offline material as well. Check out his website for the details. Well, that's it from me. You've been listening to Bogria, a.k.a. Bruce. See you later. Cheers, mate. Adios. Take it easy. Goodbye.